even some of his investigators, the police were telling him, uh, these guys are lying. You, you want us to rely on witnesses to get caught in their lies? And Snedden just pushed ahead. He didn't let it change his mind at all. He just went right ahead and prosecuted, uh, knowing he was using uh, drifters and grifters and, and people of very low uh, moral uh, status that were trying to uh, blackmail Michael with lies. And I've since discovered that was the case in Las Vegas against Erwin Schiff, who went to prison and died in prison uh, because he wrote a book. And all Judge uh, Lloyd George could say is, well, I don't need a court of any law. You're hurting the IRS with your book. All his book did is quote the IRS uh, own handbook and prove that nobody owes a personal income tax mandatorily. It's a voluntary tax. And, and, and uh, you got to read Sherwin Schiff's book called The Federal Mafia to really understand that. Uh, but go ahead. So uh, Anthony Bruce is a psychopath. How many cases did you write him up on in your reporting years, Frank? Well, um, probably published around uh, uh, between six and nine cases, you know, and I don't have them right in front of me. I sent them to um, Shane earlier today, but nine, even if it was nine, it was just a fraction of the amount of cases that uh, Anthony Bruce knowingly prosecuted innocent people. Why do you think he did that? Just because he's a wacko, quacko psychopath? Or do you think um, somebody was paying him to push the envelope outside his uh, government paycheck? I think it could have been both. Um, but what, I, what I've learned really is that Bruce is not unique. What we have in this United States here is prosecutors who have um, the ability to prosecute anyone they want without any checks or balances. Yeah, I, from watching Erwin Schiff's case uh, a decade ago uh, in 2003, 2004, uh, in several other cases, and now most recently the Clive and Bundy case in Las Vegas, where it the evidence became so humiliating to the U.S. prosecutor, a creep named Stephen Meyer, and uh, Dan, let's see, Dan was one of the other people. And who, uh, who else? I shouldn't just mention Steve Meyer, but he had Nadia and Dan helping him. And they, they just basically, uh, oh, here he is, yeah, Daniel Scheiss. Oh, <laughs> what a good name. Daniel Scheiss, Nadia Jenjua, Ahmed. I think that's an Islamic name, Ahmed. And. Uh -huh. And they went after Cliven Bundy for the crime uh, of raising cattle on Nevada public land where his family had done it for over 100 years. Did you ever hear anything about that case? Yes, I did. Wow, I'm, I'm impressed. Is that because it came across your desk or you did your own research? Well, I didn't get a chance to do much research on it, but I had a definite feeling when, when we first heard about it, that this was another case of prosecutors running amok. Oh, it was more than running amok. One of the things that surprised me exactly one week ago, I had Clive and Bundy and his attorney, Brett Whipple, sitting right now where I and Shane Bushak are, and I thought the reason Judge Gloria Navarro in her kangaroo court, or as Whipple calls her, Navarro, uh, I thought the reason she dismissed the charges, dismissed the jury first, and then a month later dismissed all charges with prejudice was because of the Wooten letter had got on the record. That is not true. The Wooten record had a uh, letter to the defense team, and he was on the prosecutor's side. He was an investigator for the BLM. That had not even got on the court record. But some damning stuff is going to come out if Cliven Bundy and his sons have the, the uh, goodness in their heart to bring a malicious persecution process uh, against them. 
One of the things that we heard about was a kill list, a written list in, uh, I like to call thug in chief, Daniel P. Love, who was head of the BLM private army of the BLM of about 150 to 200. The people dispute exactly the numbers and the BLM won't tell me. But he had a written book, a little notebook and a list of up to 25 or possibly more people. He had written down their names, Almond Bundy, Ryan Bundy, Cliven Bundy, virtually all the Bundys and a great many militia were to be killed. They weren't going out there as, they, as the court order said to simply uh, seize the cattle on what the government claimed was federal public land and take the cattle to a slaughterhouse. In fact, I don't think they seized any cattle. They, uh, what they did is that was a ruse. What they were really going out there to do was to kill the cattle, hoping that the Bundys would go get their guns. And what the Bundys didn't know at the time, in fact, even most of the militia did not know, is the BLM had positioned snipers who had orders to shoot the Bundys through the head if they could see them with a gun in their hand. Now, that didn't get on the court record. There's a whole lot of stuff, didn't, and I now understand why Gloria Navarro did not want this case to go forward. They wanted to shut it off, cut it down, and hope everybody will forget about it because we need to have a school shooting someplace, and lo and behold, up comes a school shooting in Florida, and nobody's talking about the Bundy case, that the government, the BLM, and specifically thug-in-chief Daniel P. Love should be facing indictment and charges right now. And that was just on the screen, if you're watching people, that image you saw. Flash it up again. That was the dishonorable judge, Gloria Navarro, uh, with the Bundy Ranch uh, sign behind her. Uh, she didn't actually put that in her courthouse. Somebody <laughs> photoshopped that. But that's the dishonorable judge. And I believe she should be indicted. And I have now sent a letter to Jeff Sessions and to President Trump asking him specifically to form a marshal's unit to carry out the arrest of Gloria and her bailiffs. Because I believe they're all in a conspiracy against the Bundys. And the, the funny thing, uh, Frank, I want to be sure I spell your name, your last name. It's P-A-R-L-O-T-O. -O. Is that correct? It's uh, actually, it's P-A-R-L-A-T-O. Uh, L-A-T-O? Okay, maybe my vision's slipping away. I'm under bright lights here in the television studio. Um, but I appreciate you talking to us, Frank. You're in what city, Buffalo? Well, I'm in Niagara Falls. Oh, Niagara Falls. Beautiful place to be. I've been there many times. Absolutely beautiful place to be, except you got this this uh, maniac called Anthony um, Bruce running loose. And I've spoken to Anthony. And I asked him, why are you persecuting this, uh, this guy, Shane Buschak? He said, well, you don't believe in letting people just steal money out of accounts that don't belong to them, do you? And thinking back what he said to me and talking to Shane, the account may be in Shane's name. And the, uh, the accepted for value should work for all Americans, but it doesn't. And I think Shane now realizes that, that only a select elite can use this system. That right. means that means we're not all equal under the law. We're not all equal in the in the process of law, and that's why I love hearing uh, Judge Schrader. Or Schroeder? Judge Schrader. Schrader. He just ripped Anthony uh, Bruce uh, a new oral orifice and a right. new anal orifice and combined them into one. Uh, <laughs> Anthony, I really invite you to come on my show, Anthony Bruce. I, I have some st stinging questions I can't ask unless you're sitting right here where Shane is. Uh, so what else can you tell us, uh, Frank? Well, you know, I think the, the most important thing to, to, to keep in mind, at least to, from my perspective, is that, that Bruce is a product of the system at the Department of Justice because there are no safeguards to protect against men like Anthony Bruce. Um, 
they can put innocent people in jail with impunity, and there's no punishment for it. Exactly. Thank you for stating that. Uh, I never stated it that well, but you just said it. There, there is a lack of accountability for county prosecutors and also uh, a lack of accountability for U.S. prosecutors. Uh, is that a young picture of you we're looking at? No, I think that's Frank. Is that Frank? Is that a young picture of Frank? Yeah. What do you think, Shane? It's a nice picture. It's a nice picture. <laughs> How old are you now, Frank? I'm uh, 62. 62. Well, you look you look about uh, 35 <laughs> or 40 in that picture. No, I, do, no picture. <laughs> I do the same thing, Frank. I, I don't use my current picture. <laughs> um <laughs> You know, I used to I used to chide politicians that'd be in office thirty years and they'd use the picture from when they were first elected and they hardly look like that anymore. And they still would campaign because they want everybody to think they're young and up and coming, but they're really old hat. Well, Frank, I very much appreciate you talking to us. Oh, my goodness. We do have a picture of him. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. Is there any any last words you'd like to give us about the US prosecutors, uh, Frank? Yes, I, I think there's one point that maybe could be uh, bifurcated into two concepts. Number one, uh, you know, there's probably very few people in America that would doubt the wisdom of monitoring elected officials. We scrutinize elected officials carefully, and we think it's only proper to believe that elected officials, senators, congressmen, assemblymen, mayors, uh, presidents should be Scrutinize because, after all, they're people, and people have power, and power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, conversely, very few people ever think that prosecutors are also people who could be corrupt, and nobody dares suggest that prosecutors need to be scrutinized just as much as elected officials. In fact, maybe more so because they carry with them the power to coerce people into uh, freedom-losing situations. I agree. So, I, I absolutely agree. In fact, I went to uh, our county. Uh, this is uh, headlines. I'm holding up. You can't see it, Frank, but I'm holding up the August 15th, 2012, Wednesday, front page of the Santa Barbara News Press. And I went to our county supervisors, not knowing I was going to make the front page. And I asked them to appoint a special prosecutor. And there you see Snedden on one side of me and, and Michael Jackson on the other side, and I'm in the center. And I said, you need to appoint a special prosecutor to indict Tom Snedden, because he was caught falsifying evidence, and nothing has been done. Uh, I want to ask you one last question, uh, Frank. I just came across this concept thinking... In the, in the back of my head a few months ago, would it not be a good change in the law for all states to grant a jury of 12 people who hear a case like Michael Jackson's case or anybody else's case who's found not guilty in all charges and they, can, and they do it because either they want to do jury nullification which the judges hate us to mention jury nullification, but if you took those 12 plus your two alternates, you have 14, and just give them, those 14 people, the power, after they declare the defendant not guilty of the charges, to then turn around and say, and furthermore, our jury is now acting as a grand jury, and we're indicting the prosecutors. What do you think of that idea? I think it's a good idea. <clears throat> I think that in tandem with that, we need to uh, we need to as a nation educate people so they understand that as grand jurors, they do not have to follow the lead of the prosecutors, but they should act independently and serve as true grand jurors, which is to protect the people from criminals, but also to protect potential defendants from being unfairly targeted, as Shane was by uh, malicious uh, prosecutors, a proper grand jury would have indicted Anthony Bruce and not Shane Buzak. Wow, that's a powerful statement. 
That's a very powerful statement. Did you, were you in the courthouse watching uh, Shane Buchek's case at all? No, but I did read the transcripts. And um, he was basically railroaded into... Um, Shane was railroaded. Correct. Shane was railroaded. If, if he had had, uh, if the grand jury had been an informed grand jury, he would not have been indicted. And if he had a jury that was aware of their constitutional rights, their original rights as was imagined by the founders of this nation and centuries back before that, there would have been a clear uh, role for the jury to nullify this prosecution. Would it surprise you, Frank, to know there wasn't any grand jury? There was uh, one, possibly two, and those grand juries decided not to indict Shane Bushek? At... I, I can't believe that. And Anthony Bruce decided to go right ahead anyway and do it anyway. He was known for perjury and for manipulating uh, multiple grand juries to cock up phony indictments. I'm not surprised to hear what you're telling me. Wow. Anthony Bruce, you are a naughty, naughty boy. And maybe it's time for a grand jury of we the people in New York State to indict you, Anthony Bruce. Um, you know, you know what I think, though. Honestly, if you if you could get this across to the people, there would be maybe fifty percent of prosecutors at least would become indictees because this is rampant in this country. And Bruce was just an egregious example, a man who was practically, you know, out of his mind mentally. I believe he was mentally ill. But you got a whole cadre of prosecutors like your Mister Snedden who yeah. get away with it all the time and because they can dine with judges and act a little more refined, they get away with putting innocent people in jail every single day in America. Unfortunately, you're correct. You're, you're correct and it's, it's sad, but we are educating people. That's why I do a live show because I've had the local authorities uh, actually refuse to run my show when it's taped and they get a chance to review it. So now I do my shows live. So at least it, it, it gets on the air one time. And I have had several shows. And to my amazement, I contacted the ACLU. This was a decade ago uh, when I was taking on local creeps like Snedden and uh, people in city council and, and uh, county offices. And... I contacted the ACLU, and lo and behold, they did not care about my freedom of speech. And I went to their meetings. I even joined the local ACLU for a year or two to see if it would make any difference. I actually went to the meetings, and all these old buzzards cared about were certain particular types of speech. They wanted to protect the gay, lesbian rights. They wanted to protect uh, Jewish rights. Uh, and they had a very narrow view of freedom of speech. It, it wasn't uh, William Wagner's type of freedom of speech. And so I stopped uh, belonging to the ACLU. And I think we need something that's real, that actually defends the First Amendment. Too many reporters I, I know personally that I've spoken to have spent time in jail for simply telling the truth, just simply telling the truth, and they went to prison. Sometimes state prison, sometimes federal prison, but that's another issue. Frank, I thank you so much uh, for taking your time. And by the way, if you want to go to my YouTube channel, it's uh, under William Wagner, W-A-G-E-N-E-R. And in about three or four hours, you should see the interview I did with uh, attorney Brett Whipple and Clive and Bundy. And I think it's the first time Clive and Bundy was ever treated with respect and had a chance to tell his story. And I actually learned a lot of things that I had no clue about uh, from Clive and Bundy. And even as attorney Whipple says, Bundy's in charge. I, I go with my client. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, attorney Whipple almost came to the words of saying, Clive and Bundy understands the Constitution better than I do. And I thought that was uh, really something. 
Well, thank you very much, Frank. Mm -hmm. Shane Shane wants to say something. Uh, Frank, I just want to thank you very much for, uh, you know, answering the phone and being on with us tonight. I traveled about 3,000 miles out here to be on the show, and I just want everybody out in California to know what is going on. And uh, as you know, I know you went through some tough times with Anthony Bruce, and my times were pretty bad, especially when you raided my parents' house twice with 20 agents, now knowing the case was never presented to a grand jury. And I just don't, I still would like to look him in the eye someday and say, what was the purpose of this? What, for what? Well, before it's over, Shane, you may be looking at him in the eye from a prison cell which he occupies. <laughs> that was, uh, that like was a, absolutely perfect, a perfect uh, conclusion there. But thank I, you, Frank. I, I, thank let's, you. Let's, let's look for justice. Thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have spoken with you, and I'm available anytime. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank Frank. You. Thank you, Frank. All right, that was perfect. Okay. Uh, one thing I didn't ask Frank is uh, to send me a picture of Judge Schrader. But she probably it's, has Schrader. It's probably online. I think you can pick it up somewhere. If you Google search it, Judge, it, and if you don't know how to spell his name, it's right on the transcripts. Judge Schrader. Well, that was an interesting call. So, you see, people, that's a reporter of many, many, many years who knows that Niagara Falls, Buffalo, New York, Western District. He knows the crooks of the U.S. prosecutors far better than William Wagner does. And so you heard it from somebody who's local there and knows it. What you ought to be asking yourself is how come... This man, happy birthday tomorrow, by the way, Shane. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tomorrow's his 48th birthday, and he wishes it was his 28th and knew what he knows today, right? I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> I don't feel 28 anymore. <laughs> Doesn't feel 20. I don't feel 20. I wish I could feel 38. I they never told me about this aging process. <laughs> I don't yeah. like it. Yeah, my, my grandfather gave me a little heads up on that. I'm sorry yours didn't. But um, how, how much better witness that, that this guy's been railroaded? Now, a couple of things I want you to take away from this. He was railroaded. He did not have equal justice. And the U.S. prosecutors are to blame. Judge Schrader, in this case, in this specific case, I can't say every case because I don't know all Schrader's cases, but in this case, Schrader making that reference to La Miserable. Uh, what's it called? La Les Miserables. La Miserable. Les Miserables. Les, 19, what did I keep on? 1998, I believe it came out. Yeah. Go watch that film if you've never seen it. You'll excellent, un- excellent show. You'll understand. Excellent. This crazy French police guy keeps going after this guy. I mean, his, his minor, minor crime was stealing a loaf of bread or some minor amount of food because he was literally starving and hungry. And, and my, my crime was that I stole for myself. I, I was myself. It was funny because I had a guy that, that... And you used a silver round to try to purchase well, a hot dog. Well, my sister used it at a hockey game, but it had something to do with this case. But I no. put, that put me on the radar. Yeah, it put you on the radar. And as he some, tried to spend real silver money. <laughs> And, and they knew I was a big, at the time, I was a very big Ron Paul supporter. I think I put over 2,000 signs up in Western New York yeah. when you he was running. Do you get the picture? Do you get the picture, yeah. people? Do you I, get the picture? <laughs> yeah. See, the powers that be would have no power today if Ron Paul had been elected way, way back. His first run for president, I think, 2008, right? 2008. And the yeah. second time, 2012. Yeah. He actually won eight or nine majority of the states. delegates in eight or nine states. And your corporate media lied to you. They kept saying, Romney's winning, Romney's winning. Well, Romney may have won the popular vote by just a hair, barely a hair. But he lost the delegate vote. And when you're running for president, it's the delegate vote ultimately decides who takes office. Just ask Hillary. She's still crying because she, she thought if she got all the rabble-rousers and illegal people who, to vote who don't have no right to vote because they're not even citizens. If you missed that show I did about that, you really missed a good show. Look, look for it on my YouTube channel. You'll find a small clip of it. Uh, anyway, I, I want to move on. Are you ready to roll that tape, Stephen? Watch this and I'll be back in a few minutes. You need to see this. Thank you, Shane. All you shared and all you suffered. 
A lot of people suffering people that shouldn't be suffering. We need to put some of these prosecutors, psychopaths, in jail. We need to indict, not supposed to speak convict, publicly, and prison but he them. did. And I wish I had got the interview. So I'm going to bring you part of his interview. But write the director slash warden of the Nevada Southern uh, Detention Center at 2190 East Mesquite Avenue, Pahrump, Nevada, 89060, and ask the director warden why my letter is returned, but Cliven Bundy is still in custody. What's going on here? This was returned on the 17th of November, since certified. Now, we'll take you to Eric Parker, who's the most famous shot, laying prone on the ground, you know, with his rifle between the concrete sidewalls of the I-15 there near Bunkerville, Nevada. We'll go to that interview. Story short, uh, we, we went to the Bundy Ranch because of what we saw online, um, mostly the First Amendment zones and um, the mistreatment of protesters, arresting of protesters, who weren't in the free speech zone. Um, when they assaulted uh, Margaret Houston and um, threw her on the ground and, and tased Ammon. And, you know, I didn't know any of the people. I was, I was just like everybody else mm -hmm. seeing these videos come across Facebook and, 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 and the news. And, um, and, when I saw the first of, that they were arresting people for not being in the first amendment zone, that's when I really decided I was going to go. And, um, in the beginning, I, I, I just decided I was going to go and I asked a few friends and, um, it was going down there to protest outside their first amendment zone. You know, um, that's, that's why I went and, um, you know, possibly kick over their sign, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and stand there and, and, and not be subjugated to a, a little pig pen as they were calling them. All right. Uh, Cause the first amendment isn't a zone. Yeah. No, well, I, that's, right. that's what I was going to, that's what I was going to ask you, Eric. Um, so when you went there, there, can you explain what the first amendment zone was? When you okay. Uh, I had two points here. Clive and Bundy is out of prison. That's from a clip I did six months or so ago. And the man you saw in the little narrow thing there was talking to the three, four people. That was somebody else's show. It's, a, I think, a blog talk show. But that's Eric Parker. And they kept him in prison and kept him in prison for two years, I think. I'd have to call uh, his wife, and I don't want to bother her right now. It's getting late in the evening. It's after 8, 8 p.m., uh, and I'm sure she wants to spend every minute she can with him. And he was supposed to be sentenced, and I don't know what happened to Eric Parker. But I ask you again, President Trump, grant a full, unconditional, with all rights restored to anybody, including Delamus and those other guys that are doing, one of, one of them is doing, I forget, up to 50 years, and he's already 50-something, for showing up and saying, I have a gun. I'm here with the stand with the militia. The funny thing was, all these militia guys, they weren't coordinated. This was not the coordinated militia that was sitting in the background in St. George, Utah, waiting to, to bring hell and damnation on the BLM people if even one Bundy was killed. This is not them. This is not them. All these militia, in fact, the organized militia never went down there, to my knowledge, from the people I talked to. So, Trump, do the right thing. Grant all these people complete unconditional pardons. All the Bundy militia. And then go after Anna Brown, that crooked, rotten to the core judge in Oregon, where she presided over a case very maliciously, very prejudicially against, against the law, as well as the defendants. And the jury found them all not guilty in that case. But then there was another case up there where they did convict 
some and some cop to plea of the militia. But not one of the Bundys is in jail. Not one of the Bundys has been convicted of anything. And the Hammonds are still in prison. President Donald Trump, you need to look into Dwight and Stephen Hammond's corrupt case and grant them full, unconditional pardons. Now, today, they're rotting in a federal prison. They're, his wife and small kids can't run the ranch. This whole thing is about Uranium One and Hillary and her scumbag uh, swamp people stealing the ranch to go after Uranium and other minerals. When you finally get to the bottom of it, that's what it comes down to. We're putting Americans under prosecution and horrific punishment for simply wanting to keep on growing cattle for people to eat, growing melons, and making prescriptive right use of the land. And in Bundy's case, it goes back over 100 years. In the Hammond's case, I think it only goes back 26 or 27 years. They bought the ranch with honest money, they did honest labor, and then the BLM and the federal thugs come and take it away from them when they say, no, we won't sell it to the federal government. We won't sell it. So Senator Harry Reid and the Trump comment line people call him, 202-456-1111, between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and say, please grant Stephen and Dwight Hammond a full, unconditional pardon and then order the prosecutors to pay out of their salary and their pensions recompense to the Hammonds. It shouldn't come out of the taxpayers. It should come out of the prosecutors and that crooked judge up there in Oregon. In William Wagner's opinion, for whatever it's worth. Ah, we're almost out of time, so I want to read something. This is the official transcript from the Bundy case on, on volume 6-6. Six -six. Uh, the prosecutor, Mr. Meyer, says, Your Honor, the government has a request for a motion for to continue for a week, and I can explain the reasons for our motion. Yesterday, during the course, we had a hearing on the sealed motion to dismiss. The court made its rulings. Before that, the proceeding commenced. Counsel for Ammon Bundy filed a sealed motion to dismiss as well. We did not have chance to reveal that motion in its entirety, really. You got three prosecutors plus other assistants back at the office, and you didn't have time to review that motion in its entirety? In other words, they're stalling. There must be a number of accusations, but there are also a number of allegations with respect to contact of the FBI during the course of the impeachment. Impoundment operation. Notice he uses the word impoundment operation. Stephen Meyer, I invite you here and now, Nadia, Ahmed, and uh, Daniel, what's your name? Daniel Scheiss or Scheiss. Scheiss is probably appropriate. But I invite you three prosecutors, come on the show, and I want to ask you some stinging questions I haven't even alluded to yet. So I invite you. I want to give you equal time. Equal, I believe in equal speech. I want to give you a chance to defend your crooked, rotten prosecution of the Bundys, Eric Parker, and others. He goes on to say, after impoundment, one of the questions is, how many cattle did you actually impound and take to the slaughterhouse? And how many did you just kill, hoping the Bundys would get their guns to try to stop you from killing their cattle? The Bundys are owed a lot of money, but it shouldn't come out of you taxpayers' pocket. It should come out of the salaries and the pensions of the people who did this, including every one of those BLM and FBI agents that were out there at the Bundy Ranch. Now, last paragraph on page 6-6. -6. The court, during the course of proceedings yesterday, ordered the government to review emails from the 1st of March to April 30th. The government does not have possession of the emails. The prosecution team does not have possession of the emails for the time period. I have spoken with the agency, and we can work on this on an emergency basis to get that. Okay? That's what he's written here. That's what he spoke to the judge, Gloria Navarro, that crooked to the core 
uh, recommended by Crook Senator Harry Reid of Nevada, who's now out of office, um, back on Christmas Eve when nobody was there to review her file, and then appointed by that crooked, illegal president, or I should say unlawful. He may have been legal because they swore him in, but it's still unlawful because both his parents weren't citizens. I wish Arlie Tates was here. She'd, she'd give us chapter and verse, but we don't have time. The point here, they have had over a year, they have had 700 days to get this info. And now they just want to keep the Bundys in jail a little longer while he refused in the entirety. These SOBs called Stephen Meyer, Daniel Scheiss, and Nadia Janjua Ahmed, uh, that sounds like a Saudi Arabian or a Syrian Arabic name. It's not that it makes any difference. She probably speaks perfect, flawless English. Um, these people, this Islamic woman, along with Steve Meyer, want to prosecute a cowboy, a Christian cowboy, who I couldn't convince to bring charges against the prosecutors. I'm, I'm afraid Cliven Bundy will just say, I'm going to forgive and move on. I'm still ranching. I'm just going to keep moving on. The, the problem with that is, Unless you sue them and make a little punishment, and it's a very small punishment, because civil suit does not put them in jail. We need we the people, we the people, grand juries, to indict these three people. Again, their name's Stephen W. Meyer, U.S. Prosecutor, Daniel Sheese or Scheiss, U.S. Prosecutor, and Nadia Janjud Ahmed need to be indicted because they withheld Brady evidence. And here, they, they're just wanting the judge, uh, Gloria. Anyway, I just wanted to read. Let's roll the next piece there, uh, Stephen, if you got it ready. And I hope you get this book by uh, Michael L. Stickler. Uh, I'm reading. I'm into Chapter 2. Uh, but they give, in the, for, the whole foreword is Ryan Bundy's opening, opening uh, statement. Because Ryan Bundy... Uh, would not let his court-appointed attorney speak for him. He spoke for himself. And I believe when we, if we ever hear from the jury, they will say that was the most persuasive, what Ryan Bundy said, Cliven's son. Okay, here we go. i got a short clip. We'll be back in a little bit. Very quick. ...of putting these together. I want to say thank you to C-SPAN for having the guts to listen to the families of survivors and those affected by 9-11. A person that before 9-11, I was a janitor on the towers. I worked in the building for 20 years. 20 years cleaning the stairwells of the North Tower. Now, have you ever cleaned 110 floors of stairwells? It's bad! It's really bad. It's not easy. Try doing 25 stairwells, 25 floors. It's really difficult. It's not easy. But that was my job. But incredible was that God really prepares you for things in life. And I'm telling you this because I was agnostic. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in anything before 9-11, honestly. I was like, oh, I'm a spiritualistic. But in reality, was God was preparing me with tools for 20 years the first 10 years at the World Trade Center, I cleaned the office of the then governor of New York, Mario Cuomo. And I have to be the person with somebody else that set up all the chairs on all the press conferences. And I have to set up the podium, put the water for the governor, and I have to stay there in case of an, any accident or any, anything that had to be cleaned. And then also, I have to be the person that have to be on the legislation meetings at the office. And I have you seen politics and legislations are really boring, really boring. But I have to be the person there that gave coffee, bagels, and donuts to the legislators. Now, I said that God has a very strange sense of humor. Huh because he was giving me the tools that I was going to use after 9-11. Because again, then I learned from the office how to set up a press conference, what a soundbite was, argumentation and debate, 
everything because I lived through it for 10 years. And after 9-11, when I became an activist, I just used all those tools. You know that was? That was the guy that President Bush wanted to have his picture taken with, and he's on, on the pile of 9-11 before it got cleaned out. Uh, after President Bush ran and hid, got an Air Force One, and left his state of Florida, where his brother was governor, and flew out towards Texas to hide. To hide in case we all figured it out. 9-11 was an inside job. And there is Willie Rodriguez, who you never hear about anymore. You, 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 you can't find him anywhere on corporate media anymore because he exposed 9-11 as an inside job. He goes into detail and shows you how the, the explosions in the basement were knocking out the support that brought the Twin Towers straight down. It was a perfect demolition job. The airplanes you saw were a diversion. So what's my point? We have malicious prosecution by psychopathic U.S. prosecutors, and I've had a U.S. prosecutor on this show. She had a book called The U.S. Versus Bush. Uh, but from Tom Snedden, our local psychopath who's now dead, uh, who went after Michael Jackson, in spite of overwhelming evidence that he was in, even some of his own cops told him. I mean, he doesn't run the, the sheriff's department, but some of the sheriffs that he wanted to go in there and get stuff came back to Snedden and said, it ain't so. These are liars. We can't depend on Snedden wasn't dissuaded. He just charged ahead. I'm going to get him. And we're going to do a show someday, and I'm going to explain to you why Snedden had a vested interest in getting Michael Jackson. Not just to go out with a cloud of glory. Instead, Snedden went out in a cloud of shame, absolute shame. His tombstone should be taken and put <coughs> at the bottom of a urinal so people can pee on it. I know that sounds a little drastic. <coughs> anyway, the next tape, Stephen, if we're ready. What happened to him, what happened to a lot of people, the system is wrong. The attorneys are not on your side in most cases. A bar association meeting in Santa Watch Barbara, this, we'll be back in a minute. Christina Stanley. Uh, the late Christina Stanley, uh, was making an announcement. She was running to replace Tom Snedden. And Gordon Auchincloss turned to me after I said something to somebody. He said, well, don't you really think Michael is guilty? And I said to him, and I had, this was, it gave me a little pleasure. I said, Mr. Auchincloss, <clears throat> you prosecutors proved to me he was innocent of everything. With your lying witnesses that get caught, uh, your bogus fingerprint evidence, and... I started to go into this fingerprint evidence, and to me, nothing sticks in my mind so greatly is that day you put the little pointer pen light laser up on the calendar of the Barely Legal magazine after you had got, you had got Gavin at least seven, eight times to say, yes, Michael gave me that magazine in the bed, and yes, I'd last been at Neverland in such and such a month. I forget it was January, February, or March. And the date on it was October, and you made Gavin... You made Gavin read the date. And then you asked him again, now when were you last at Neverland? And you say he gave you this many words. That, didn't, you, didn't that make a striking impression? I looked at the jury and they were like, the front row was going like rolling their eyes like, oh my God, can we do any? Why is this going on? I mean, the jurors were rolling their eyes. How soon before that did you know? I mean, you must have been laying that trap for him. You, how soon before the trial started did you know that Tom Snedden had physically given the magazine, the physical magazine, with no gloves on, and given it to Gavin Avizio in the grand jury indictment proceeding? How soon before that did you know? Well, my law firm partner and co-counsel, Susan Yu, uh, she was the one that I worked through all the evidence with. Uh, we were the lead counsel in the case. Um, Randy and Michael Jackson asked me to come to Florida, said they wanted Susan, you and me, to, uh, to defend Michael as lead counsel. And she was the one that I primarily went through all the evidence with. Susan Yu is the most brilliant legal strategist I've ever met in my career. She's a tireless worker. She's brilliant. She's intuitive. And she doesn't leave a stone unturned. So we were going through all of this a number of months before the trial and fastened upon this 
this issue. And it was one of many... Well, that was exactly, that was from December 10th, 2010. I'll never forget that date. That's when Tom Mesereau, 